Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of JFN, I am happy to welcome you to today's briefing on poverty and the impact of COVID-19. This webinar is part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. This is the second of these deeper dives, and we will be having a third one on Tuesday, June 9th. During all these briefing, briefings, we will discuss the many challenges the coronavirus pandemic has created for Jews facing poverty and the agencies that serve them. We will hear the needs from the service providers on the ground supporting our front lines, share best practices and information, and strategize on ways to respond collectively. Today, we will focus on mental health and aging. I will now hand it over to our moderator for all these conversations, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridgeman Group Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Here's to you, Susan. Thank you so much. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to this webinar. We're so excited to have three terrific panelists today um, who each are taking a different camera angle um, at the questions that we are all facing uh, in this time of COVID. Um, so first, uh, we have uh, Paula Goldstein, who is the president and CEO of JFNCS of Greater Philadelphia. She's been the CEO since 2011. Um, she's been at JFNCS for 30 years, um, and we're looking forward to hearing um, your thoughts on how things are, how things changed. Um, we'll, we'll get started with you in just a moment. Um, and then we'll have uh, Jordan Golden, <clears throat> who is the president and CEO of JF and CS Pittsburgh. And then we will have Paula Pretlow, who is um, a trustee at the Weinberg Foundation, a trustee at the Kresge Foundation, and on the task force um, of the Federation in San Francisco, who is um, leading a, uh, a response to COVID there as well. So welcome. We're delighted to have all three of you. Um, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, first, uh, if you have questions throughout, please chat them in through the Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll start taking them around the bottom of the hour. Um, so please do so. Um, and then second, um, we are excited to have people who um, have been at some of the ones in the past. So if there are webinar questions um, that you have or observations that you had in prior webinars that you want to tie to this webinar, that's great. And if this is your first one, welcome. Um, we're delighted to have your questions and comments and thoughts. Um, so first, why don't we get started. Um, uh, Paula uh, Goldstein, if you'd be willing to kick us off and tell us a little bit about um, JFNCS of Philadelphia, Greater, Phil Greater Philadelphia. Um, tell us just a couple seconds about your organization um, and then tell us some of the big changes that you've seen um, as COVID has hit. Um, what, what's changed, what's started, what's stopped, um, what's different, um, what's been unexpected, um, and to tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're learning. Um, again, the purpose of these webinars is to really connect everyone to what's happening in the field, um, as well as have some broader observations. So we're excited to learn from you. Hi, thank you so much, Susan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to share some insights from Philadelphia. Uh, JFCS of Greater Philadelphia is about $16.5 million organization. We like to tell people that we exist for four main reasons. The first is to help people to become financially stable. Uh, the second is to contribute to the health and safety of children, teens, and families. The third is to support the most vulnerable in our community. And by that, we mean those with intellectual, emotional, physical disability, and also um, our older adult population. And the last thing, and the last big reason why we exist is to build community. Uh, we provide our baseline services of counseling and care management, but if we are able to connect people that we serve to community, help them volunteer for community, and help others in the community um, to connect with them, we feel like we've done it all. So building community is, is a big deal for us in Philly. Um, in particular, what we call our vulnerable adult population and older adult population um, is one that we are primarily uh, funded through uh, the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia to provide services for. And in that uh, area as well are our Holocaust survivors that we serve and we are funded primarily through the uh, Flames Conference in New York. So when I speak today, I'm speaking um, from a mental health standpoint, 
uh, about those individuals that we serve, and they are about 2,500 to 3,000 a year of the 25,000 lives that JFCS touches a year. Um, I'm speaking about them, and I'm speaking about the larger community um, because one of the things that ha has happened uh, since the COVID crisis is that we are needed by others um, in the community in addition to those that we continue to serve. Um, and I think, Susan, one of the questions that you had posed was, you know, has your pot gotten larger or smaller in the midst of COVID? And I think in many ways for us, it's gotten larger. So let me talk to you a little bit about what's happened since COVID um, in the mental health arena. We um, are seeing uh, what we see all the time, which is very, very vulnerable individuals who, are, uh, who suffer from a lot of emotional instability. And that problem has only intensified uh, through the midst of the COVID crisis. So the vulnerable from a mental health standpoint have only become more vulnerable. And of course, you only have to look at the news um, to see the impact of COVID from a mental health standpoint on so many um, in the country. We've seen a rise in suicide, in depression, in anxiety, and of course, the trigger for a lot of this is isolation. This is a population of people that felt isolated on much before COVID and are feeling even more isolated now. Um, we have also been contacted uh, by others in the community who didn't necessarily access help from JFCS before. Um, who are isolated and in need of mental health support. So we've had to be quick on our feet to really take a look at the needs in the community, um, hear from people who are our traditional funders to see how nimble they are in terms of us using grant dollars and donor dollars to be able to support broader basis in the community. And fortunately, um, we have been very fortunate uh, with our donors and our funders in that arena. Um, and we've also had to look for some new dollars in the midst of the COVID crisis. Also had, um, I don't wanna say an easy time doing that, but there's been a compelling case uh, for funding specifically around COVID crisis. Uh, because people really, really want to help. Um, foundations want to redirect dollars right now to help, donors as well. And so we've been able to have conversations with people that are not traditional funders of ours to say, people need us and they need us in this way or in that way um, and we could use your help. So it's opened up some new doors as well to uh, grantors who may not have known that we were around before. I think that uh, what have we been doing? What has changed? Well, we are working remotely as are all uh, JFCSs across the country right now. And so the first thing we had to look at is how are we going to reach people in need of mental health support counseling um, if we are working remotely. And that introduced the concept of telemental health. For those who were able, who had the ability to connect via internet, who had a computer um, to connect with us through telemental health. And that has been wonderful. Uh, in addition, for those older adults and primarily older adults that we serve, but also vulnerable adults, who do not have access to a computer, um, that we have been using telephone contact um, to have counseling sessions with them as well. And they have been rather robust. And we've moved quickly into a support group model so that we could see more people 
who are interested in coming on and talking about specific topics. One topic that we quickly organized and are running a couple support groups around are for family members who have lost people from COVID. Uh, so there are a number of things um, that we are doing in that arena. So one of the things we've had to pay attention to uh, because we're working a lot with populations that are very poor are what can we do to enhance connectivity uh, in this time of COVID. It's great to say telemental health, but there is a large percentage of people that we currently serve that do not have uh, a computer. And so one of the first things we did in going to a new donor was to ask for dollars to be able to purchase Chromebooks for um, those who don't have them. And in addition to that, ask many donors that we're working with how they would feel about directing some dollars towards internet purchase for these families. So this is a really new thing. Um, this is not something that we've done before, but the biggest need right now is for people who feel tremendously isolated to be able to make that connection. And so this is taking us in a new direction. We, and I've talked to others across the country, have purchased over 50 Chromebooks and many other organizations are doing the same um, and giving them out um, to people who desperately need them. And then in addition to that, we're running two to three, two hour sessions a week um, to help people with technology. And how do I get on? How do I know what to do? How do I even get started uh, with something like this? So this has been a tremendous, tremendous change. Right, right. Good, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, that's fantastic. Um, next up, I'd love to talk to Jordan, if you can give us a sense of how things are looking from Pittsburgh. Um, a quick note on Jordan. Jordan has been the president and CEO since 2016. And before that, um, he was the uh, clinical director, I believe, um, uh, sorry, chief operating officer um, and director of clinical services and elder care. Um, and I know you have a background in supervision, outcome measurement and grant writing and program development and pretty much every every aspect of um, JF and CS and you've been there for a decade. So tell us a little bit about um, from your perspective how things how things have changed, um, what's different, interesting, um, and what we should know. Sure. So JFCS Pittsburgh, just first a quick note about our agency. Uh, we have about a $8 million budget, 100 staff, Similar to Paula's agency, we provide a range of community-based services, including a food pantry, immigration and refugee services, mental health services, employment services, and of course, services to older adults. Um, within the older adult sphere, um, we have a partnership with two other local nonprofits, our JCC and our Jewish Association on Aging, called AgeWell Pittsburgh. Um, together, collaboratively with AgeWell Pittsburgh, we serve about 10,000 seniors and their caregivers each year. Um, and we also developed an outcome measurement tool for measuring the impact of community-based services on seniors called the PFMI Pro, uh, which was developed in consultation with the University of Pittsburgh. So talking about seniors, um, and I, and I want to mention also that I am the facilitator of the Older Adults Affinity Group through uh, this initiative, and so my comments today don't reflect only what we're doing here in Pittsburgh, but also uh, what my colleagues around the country have shared with me. Um, also, I want to mention that even though I'm talking about seniors, seniors are a pretty broad category that encompasses people uh, with a range of abilities and life situations. So I apologize if my comments aren't very precise or if you can find faults with certain things that I say, uh, but it is a pretty large, diverse group of people that I'm talking about. Um, in the United States, around 17% of our population are seniors. And the seniors who live outside of facilities of those seniors, about a third of seniors live alone which is especially relevant right now during the current pandemic. Also, between 9 and 14 percent of seniors live in poverty, and this is predating COVID. Um, the poverty, poverty rates haven't changed a whole lot since COVID because the vast majority of seniors were unemployed prior to COVID beginning. So, how have our services changed since the COVID pandemic started? Well, previously with seniors, the emphasis typically was on live person-to-person -person services. 
And now, of course, as Paula described, a lot of our services are being conducted by telephone or video for those seniors who have access to that technology. We had friendly visitor programs. They're now uh, friendly phone call programs. Our social workers and our psychotherapists typically would see seniors in their offices or sometimes in their homes. Now, again, it's via telephone or uh, video chat if that's available. A lot of the seniors in our community participated in senior centers. Most cities in the country have senior centers where seniors can go and congregate. That's gone right now. And um, Pittsburgh and several other communities have started virtual senior centers. Um, again, this is, this is something that's kind of interesting because before COVID, virtual senior centers were somewhat controversial because it was thought that they might actually de-incentivize de seniors from going out into the community and being with other people. But because seniors are so isolated right now, these virtual senior centers have been a real lifeline uh, for a lot of older adults. Congregate meals is also a really important service that was provided previously where seniors would go out into the community and eat with other seniors. That's gone. Um, in Pittsburgh, we have grab and go meals where seniors can go to a senior center and take a meal home with them if they're able to get to the senior center to do that. If they're not, um, there are a lot more, not just in Pittsburgh, but across the country, a lot more home delivery of meals taking place, um, both Meals on Wheels as well as food pantries that are now starting to deliver meals to seniors. In-home caregivers to help seniors who are living independently to help them with their daily activities. Um, those services are still going strong, but there are some differences. Some families actually canceled their aging loved ones in home care because they didn't want to risk exposure to a caregiver who might be inadvertently uh, a carrier for the coronavirus. Um, on the flip side, though, other families enrolled their older adults um, because they would rather have uh, a certain degree of risk from a caregiver providing services in a home than having their loved one go into a, a nursing home or other facility where, as we know from the news, once the coronavirus does take hold, it can spread very, very quickly. Um, and then finally, um, we have caregiver support groups. Those have always been very uh, important, very popular. Um, they've gone virtual. And since the coronavirus pandemic has hit, attendance is way up. The groups are meeting more frequently. And the focus really is how families uh, who are struggling to help their aging loved ones can get support and ideas from other group participants. The three primary areas of need that we're seeing seniors having right now um, fall into the categories of food access, socialization, and technology. And, and this will overlap a little bit with what Paula was saying earlier. Uh, with food access, seniors, of course, tend to shop more frequently than, than younger people and smaller quantities. They can't carry as much food at once, and many seniors lack the money to really stock up. Um, but of course, more frequent shopping also increases the risk of exposure. Um, many seniors that we work with um, have been taking public transportation to the grocery store or to a food pantry. And even seniors who live on campuses with multiple buildings, these campuses often have dining halls for the residents, and now they've really struggled to shift and figure out how to deliver meals to individual apartments. And so we're seeing um, challenges with seniors getting adequate nutrition, even those who are living on these campuses. Um, in fact, uh, one of my colleagues from the affinity group was telling me how a Holocaust survivor living on one of these campuses has lost 16 pounds since the coronavirus stay at home order began. The second category is socialization, which again, Paula talked a lot about. Uh, humans, of course, we are social beings. We need personal contact to thrive emotionally, to thrive physically. And for seniors who have limited funds and who may have mobility challenges, socialization prior to COVID meant going to senior centers, maybe going to doctor's appointments, going shopping, even if it's window shopping. And most of these activities have stopped. Um, one senior uh, commented to a colleague of mine that they would rather die of COVID than to be as isolated as they are feeling right now. So clearly the socialization does have an impact on the mental health of older adults in our community. Um, we're, we're actually seeing a, a mix though in how it's impacting people. On one hand, we're seeing uh, seniors who have a previous mental health history of having increased rates of depression, increased anxiety, but we're seeing other seniors who, although they were depressed prior to COVID, um, they're experiencing what I call the misery loves company phenomenon. Uh, previously, they felt like everyone in the world was doing well except for me, 
And now they're saying, well, everyone in the world is really struggling just like I am. And so it, there's something validating about that for a certain subset of the seniors that we're working with. And then the Holocaust survivors we're working with, and again, there's a mix, but the Holocaust, some of them have said, you know, the COVID pandemic is terrible, but we've been through worse. And so they have a different perspective on that. Finally, uh, the third bucket of primary needs that we're seeing is technology. Um, and everything is online right now, government services, social services, shopping, medical care, everything is online. And like some of the vulnerable uh, clients that Paula described, a lot of our seniors are not tech savvy. They don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have computers, they don't have smartphones. And even if they do have some of those devices, they're really limited in how they can use them. And it's challenging to get people to support them and assist them uh, because seniors often need someone sitting right there next to them to help them, uh, and they don't have that right now. Um, the lack of technology means that they're not having doctor's appointments with a video chat. It's strictly by telephone, so there are fewer eyes on the seniors in their homes. Uh, the seniors are having fewer medical appointments, and not every doctor can or is willing to do mental health. So there's less monitoring of blood pressure and other indicators. As a result, seniors now are at greater risk of falls, of negative medical events, and of medication complications. And when a, a negative medical event does happen, seniors have to ask themselves, what's the greater risk? For me to stay at home with my pain and my physical challenge, or for me to risk going to a hospital or to a doctor's office? Good, so thank you to both of you. I just wanna take a moment uh, before we turn to uh, Paula P. And I'd like to pull a couple threads uh, from what you two have said and connect it to some of our earlier webinars because I think there are some very important sort of themes. So first, in our first webinar, we really were talking about system-wide issues. And I do remember something that Ruben Rotman had said, which was just really thinking about where are places where we can not only serve the immediate need, we're in a, in a sprint, um, but also set things up for the longer term because this is not going away anytime soon. So both of you have really um, addressed that. So I, I appreciate that. Um, in our, the second webinar, we were really focused on food insecurity and housing, and there it was very, very focused on poverty uh, for both of those, um, especially in New York and Baltimore, which is where our panelists were from, um, and they were pretty large-scale questions about, you know, enlisting Uber to help people, um, to you know, bring food to people, um, and large-scale questions in, in both of those cities. And today we're kind of moving across the country. We're in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, um, which are sort of medium-sized cities, um, and uh, a lot of the issues that you all are talking about disproportionately impact people who are living in poverty and also are issues um, that cross income boundaries uh, between mental health and aging um, and isolation. And so those are very diverse populations. And Jordan, as you said, it's hard to make generalizations. So I appreciate you're trying to, to pull those out. And especially with both of you, the idea that, you know, if things used to be person to person, we were all trying to push people to, to come in and be in person and not rely on sort of the technology and now having to do that 180. Um, and what a, what a change that is for those individuals, what a change it is for your staff members who are trying to serve in this new way um, and just communicating that to donors and to your communities about how that has shifted. So um, I really appreciate the, the pivot that you all are trying to make right in this moment to try to keep your eye on that longer term or sort of mid medium term goal of you know, reducing isolation and providing services, um, but without necessarily not only the old tools that you had about, about in-person uh, connections, but also the fact that not everyone whom you're trying to serve now does have access to the Chromebooks, Paula, as you were saying, and does have access to um, the kinds of technologies that I think many people on this on this webinar have access to on a regular basis. And so just the importance of that good old fashioned, you know, shoe leather, picking up the phone and, um, and calling people and making those connections as is kind of making a comeback. So, um, so I really appreciate that from both of you is how your agencies really have, have pivoted in that service way. So now let's turn to Paula. Paula, um, just a moment about Paula. After a successful career in financial services, she has now turned her attention full-time, I think, uh, to, to community service um, at, in a variety of leadership capacities. Um, as we said earlier, she's a trustee at the Weinberg Foundation um, that has a significant focus on uh, the Jewish community, a focus on poverty, aging, all, a number of things that we've talked about, um, and also 
also uh, the Kresge Foundation, which is many of you have heard of. Um, and she also is very involved in her um, community, in the San Francisco community, focused on the COVID task force um, and in her synagogue. Um, and I think one of the themes that um, we've noticed across the last number of months is, um, is the role that Jews of color are playing um, in uh, the dialogue right now. Um, and so one of the things that uh, as we think about uh, the COVID uh, emergency and how it is disproportionately affecting different groups of people, one way to think about that is that not only is it disproportionately affecting people in poverty, but it is also disproportionately affecting Jews of color in our community. And there are a couple different ways to think about that. And Paul, I'm hoping you can sort of break this down for us a little bit. But one is as beneficiaries um, of the services and making sure that we have a sense of what those numbers look like or what those services look like, what those needs are, um, and that those get elevated. But also um, as leaders in our community, Jews of Colors who are uh, leading organizations that are responding um, and making sure that they are um, appropriately supported as, as leaders in the response, that they're getting funded, that they are um, getting recognized and they're getting supported um, in the same way that other organizations are, are being supported and funded uh, to be able to respond. So um, that was a a lot. There's a lot, uh, Paula, that you can share with us. But if you at least give us a couple of thoughts on um, sort of your take on some of the questions about Jews of color and sort of how you think about that, um, and then your role sort of leading a variety of different funding responses um, in this time, um, we'd be grateful. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for the invitation to join the webinar today. It's a, truly a privilege. And I, I think I, I do have a perspective and privilege of uh, being able to see how things are unfolding in this emergency from both a national lens and then uh, a more local lens here in the Bay Area. Um, and from the national perspective, having uh, the opportunity to serve on the boards of both the Kresge Foundation um, and the Weinberg Foundation, um, uh, the response was uh, immediate and continues. And in fact, even on the local level uh, with the uh, Federation Task Force on which I'm uh, uh, participating, the funding is coming in waves. And in all across the three organizations or the, uh, the three efforts in which I'm involved, we've had two, uh, two phases. And let me just uh, give you examples. With the Weinberg Foundation, uh, and we've committed over $10.5 million at this point uh, in emergency funding, and that is in addition to acceleration of grants that we already have in place um, with organizations across the country, we focus uh, in our priority communities, which are Baltimore, um, San Francisco, of course, uh, Chicago, New York, Northeast Pennsylvania, and Israel. And so we are doing deep work in, uh, those, in Hawaii. Let me not forget Hawaii. Uh, we're doing deep work in those, in those communities, uh, which we have designated priority communities. Likewise, with the Kresge Foundation, we have had two waves or two phases of grant making. Uh, the first place based in the priorities of communities of Detroit, New Orleans, and Memphis. And now second phase, it's broadened out to national and governmental efforts. Um, bringing it closer home to San Francisco, with the uh, Federation Task Force, um, that task force got started in response to the COVID crisis uh, quite early. Uh, we were on the phone on March 20th. I went back and looked at the dates to see when we uh, got together. I was called by Danny Grossman um, and, and John Goldman as a community leader to serve on this task force. The task force is made up of both community uh, leaders lay leaders um, and, and members of the Board of the Federation. There, um, the two priority goals were set to address the urgent needs of a broad population uh, most impacted by the COVID crisis in uh, the areas served by the Federation, and then address short-term needs to uh, stabilize the Jewish ecosystem. Um, and then I wanna bring it even closer in to my synagogue community, which has also had a response uh, to the COVID crisis uh, through di discretionary funding with the rabbis uh, who then disperse funds or work with JFCS uh, to help 
whether that's around getting food on the table, whether it is accessing mental health services, uh, whether it is around domestic violence. And to tie mental health and domestic uh, violence together, I think is, is really important. And as we are sheltering in place, uh, we all are aware there's an uptick. That is a mental health issue as well as very much a physical issue. So how we respond to families in need that way is very, very important. And that work is getting done uh, here in the Bay Area through organizations like JFCS, through Shalom Bait, uh, and others who are doing very, very important work. One of the things we're doing uh, in my synagogue, uh, and I serve on the board of my synagogue, is that we are calling the elders in our community, the older adults, um, one by one, and we are repeating. And we are finding that that simple connection by phone, by video if the capability exists, primarily by phone, means the world. And it, it also serves to tie uh, the community closer together. So uh, I just want to throw that out there as a very simple thing that each and every one of us on this call can pick up the phone and reach out to an elder uh, who may not do it first. Um, and, and it goes a very, very long way. Addressing the needs of older adults as well through food service, um, food pantries, having delivery services, uh, uh, delivering food, Meals on Wheels was mentioned. There are other uh, delivery services that are specifically focused on uh, getting food to older adults, as well as to those families who've ex escaped domestic violence and are now in shelters, so that they are safe, feel safe, are housed, and are being fed. Um, I would like, as uh, Susan, you mentioned, I would like to bring into the conversation a very real way, uh, because I think it does often get overlooked or just forgotten, is the community, the communities of Jews of color. And how do we uh, address, recognize, and respond both reactively and proactively uh, to communities of color in our Jewish ecosystem? Um, I think it overall is extremely important, in fact, imperative to bring a diversity and equity lens into the work we do as organizations as funders. Jews of color traditionally aren't particularly tethered to organizations in the broader ecosystem. So we have to do the extra work, I believe, to answer uh, the needs of those populations. I'm not saying that most Jews of colors are living in poverty are, or are impoverished. But what I am saying is that we know that Jews of color in general are, have less access to the traditional funding sources and organizations by virtue of the fact many of those uh, Jewish uh, of color led organizations are smaller and under resourced to begin with. And so it, it just compiles uh, the problem. Also with older adults, and those most vulnerable and with mental health issues in the era of uh, COVID um, and, and the emergency, we know that uh, people of color in general are disproportionately affected because of pre-existing uh, conditions, because of obesity, because of diabetes, because of other underlying health issues that put them at greater uh, and more increased risk. So um, in closing, um, I just like to reiterate, how do we, in populations in general, and in Jews of color communities in particular, how do, what do we do? I'm going to quote uh, a paper done by Echo and Grain and Bridge Fan, and a term that I became familiar with first through Brian Stevenson, and that is get proximate. Get close, understand. Get reflective. We need to ask ourselves, what can we do and how do we do it? And jump in and then get accountable. So get proximate, 
get reflective, get accountable. Fantastic. Um, so there's so much there to unpack. Just starting on the last piece um, that you mentioned, um, uh, the Bridge Band Group, where I'm a senior advisor at Echoing Green, with Cheryl Dorsey is the CEO, uh, put out an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review um, and a full white paper, which is available free on our website with a lot of information about um, people of color um, in the general nonprofit world and the effect um, of sort of racial equity and lack of inequity, lack, lack of equity. Um, and just as you, exactly as you mentioned, so race is one of the most reliable predictors, not only of life outcomes like obesity and infant death and whatnot, but uh, African-American business owners are five times more likely to be de denied a loan, um, three times more likely to be um, surged at a traffic stop, all those sorts of things. So there's the effect on um, people of color as beneficiaries or as, um, as people who are you know, in, on the service side, but there's also some very important effects um, on the size of uh, on the side of sort of accessing um, capital, so there's there's a lot of disparity in terms of again this is the general nonprofit sector, not not the Jewish nonprofit sector, but um, but there are disparities in the revenues and in the unrestricted assets um, between um, white led and black led early stage organizations. So um, black led organizations are tw uh, 25 percent um, lower average revenues. They have 76 percent lower. Um, unrestricted net assets. Um, and there are sort of a variety of things, um, as Paula said, that are just really important to, to pay attention to. First of all, people don't necessarily, who are in the funding role, <clears throat> don't necessarily do that math or, or check it out um, on their own portfolio. So certainly that information is the first um, is the first step. But exactly, Paula, as you said, getting connected, building rapport, securing support, sustaining the relationships. They just are inequitable access to social networks, um, inequitable access to connections with the philanthropic community. Um, there's a fair amount of you know implicit bias as there is um, on all sorts of um, dimensions. Um, but so so really, how to think about that as um, I'm sure both sides of the equation as beneficiaries and um, as leaders in the funding gap um, for, for uh, organizations. So thank you for bringing that into, into the conversation. And perhaps we can get into that a little bit more um, as we go through. But um, right, I'm going to open it up to the chat in just a moment. But before I do that, I just wanted to ask all three of you if we can think a little bit about the role of philanthropy in this time. Um, clearly, a lot of the donors that I speak to, and perhaps many of you speak to, are are, there's so much need. It's a little bit hard to figure out um, where to go first um, and, and even whether or not to, to go now or later uh, because again as we know this isn't gonna gonna end anytime soon and so you know how do you think about especially in something like human services where there is government money available um, how do you think about that that turn to more of an interest in human services right now because clearly people are seeing the need they want to be funding for the short term they want to be funding in ways that set things up better in the long term. Um, so it would be great to hear from you about how you think about the what philanthropy can uniquely do in this moment, um, given the need, given the time, and given um, the other sources of funding um, that we've talked about. So maybe Paula or Jordan, can we start with you? And then we can, um, Paula, Pretlo, maybe you can kind of um, put a bow on it for us. I'm happy to start. Um, uh, thank you, Paula, by the way. I just, you know, I a couple things that you said, and I'll go right to philanthropy, really resonated no, because- should, If you have thoughts on what Paula said, feel free to engage there. That's- Okay. Um, what I was gonna say is that the non-traditional approaches in mental health are really um, outnumbering the traditional approaches. And so what we, what we have found in Philly is one, um, there are tons and tons of people in the community that want to help that want to give back, that want to talk to somebody who's isolated. And so where we have the traditional telemental health session, we also have a myriad of other ways to connect that we've just created, like 15 minute check-ins and quickly put together a warm line of just incredible people in the city that wanna talk to people. And it's up and it's running and if you wanna call, you want to call once a week if you want to call twice a week every week for ongoing you can get it so i just think you know reaching people and connectivity is huge um 
And the only other thing I'll say about it is some people we found, we and I was saying this to Susan last week, we've just really enhanced our a resource page on our website and we push it out all the time because sometimes people just want an inspiration quote. They don't need to talk to somebody, but they're feeling down and they want that quote, or they want show, someone to show them how to meditate or any number of things. And so, you know, just having the ability to get a quick fix of something that'll make you feel better is also where it's at. So there's a lot of variety in the mix. And then coming back to philanthropy, what I have found is that really talking with people that we have close working relationships with, whether it's a foundation or a donor, and giving them kind of the inside look at some of what we are being asked for. This is what people are saying that they really need and here's why. Um, has really uh, moved the needle in terms of people wanting to give um, to what we're doing. It's, you know, normally what happens in the world of philanthropy is and, and rightfully so, if I have a conversation or our development team has a conversation with somebody, they may say to us, that sounds great, we'd love to support it. And they may say to us, you know, that sounds really great, but that's not what we support. Uh, and I think what's happened is there's been this space created by many funders in the community for COVID and wanting to help. And so if you can bring them in to an inside conversation about what the needs are and why, um, you can have great success at opening that door, even if it is only for the duration of COVID. Yeah, good. Jordan, we also had some questions in the chat, which I'll just work in now about advertising counseling to new clients in a broader community and how you get the word out and what are the best ways to do that. Um, and then also uh, questions about, are there any silver linings, any things uh, that people who have potentially limited mobility issues can now participate better than they could before? Um, and just some examples, um, again, of what, what philanthropists can do. So anything in there that, that you um, can address would be great. Wow, I would love to address all of them. I don't think I have enough time, um, but let me just start with the philanthropy one and then see if we can circle back to those other, those other items. I think um, for the philanthropy question, you know, the, one of the biggest concerns I have is that, and I know many people have said this already about the COVID pandemic, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. This is going to last for a long time. If we're talking about older adults in particular, because they're so highly vulnerable, even as the stay at home orders start to lift, the seniors are not gonna be going out. And so this is a long-term shift in how services are gonna be provided to seniors uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, which means that there's going to be a, a need for funding to support these services for quite a while. Um, colleagues I've spoken to, myself included, are, are concerned, you know, with the stock market taking the ride that it's taking, portfolios are down. Um, will there be dollars available in the philanthropic community to continue to support these kinds of initiatives in the long run? Um, it's something that organizations are very worried about. You know, in an ideal world, if we wanted to shift all of our services from in-person services to virtual services, we would do a small pilot, we would get maybe some funding for it, we would learn lessons from it, we would then expand it, take it to scale, look for more funding. Instead, what we've done is within a period of days or weeks, we just full steam ahead shifted directions into something without sufficient uh, funding to support it, without sufficient experimentation and measurement tools and those sorts of things that we normally would do. Um, and we're, we're, we're just kind of doing it because we don't have a choice, we have to be doing it. So um, the things that we're seeing now that philanthropists could support would be to help organizations cover some of the expenses that they've incurred in making such a dramatic rapid shift uh, because there wasn't enough time to go seek funding and to, to go through the normal policies and channels that we would normally go through. Um, and then we're seeing some very specific needs that government sources and other sources really aren't covering. So for example, the, the food delivery initiatives that are happening all over the country, um, the organizations providing them don't have specific funding for those food delivery initiatives. PPE, personal protective equipment, seniors have a very hard time Lots of us have a hard time getting it. Seniors in particular have a hard time getting it, getting surgical masks, the things that they need in order to be safe and to paying for those items. Technology instruction, as we described, you know, Chromebooks, but also internet access and instruction and in how to use the technology. Um, 
we need to develop something that seniors can learn from and uh, philanthropist funders may be interested in supporting those kinds of initiatives. Transportation, if we don't want seniors to take public transportation to get to an appointment or to the grocery store or the food pantry, maybe there would be funding available to help cover uh, an Uber or a Lyft to kind of decrease the risk that seniors are experiencing. And then these virtual senior centers that are starting to grow across the country, um, providing some support for those initiatives also, so that maybe there can be some national curricula that can be used, some national programming that can be used so that each community doesn't need to invent its own uh, in, its own information. So I think there's lots of different ways that philanthropy can can be uh, more involved. Regarding silver linings, you know, there there are always silver linings in the midst of crisis if we if we know how to look for them. And I think that one of the silver linings that all of us are experiencing is that we we are recognizing just how much we value human connection. Um, now that it's so much harder to engage people, we we really see how much we we uh, value that. Um, and again, things like these, these virtual senior centers and these other initiatives, we're getting so much positive feedback from, from older adults and from other clients as well, who are so appreciative of the, of the way that the community is there for them in their time of need. Mm -hmm. um, people who don't have the, the financial means to pay for services, um, but they, they do appreciate that they're not being forgotten, they're not being uh, lost, they're not slipping through the cracks. And I think those kinds of feelings are gonna strengthen their bonds with the community. Good. Good. Um, Paula Petlow, any thoughts on, on this last piece of the conversation? Yes, I think the, uh, the, the demands on philanthropy, the role of philanthropy uh, will continue. We are not in a sprint. We are in a marathon. And there will be continued areas that crop up where government can't respond or just won't respond quickly enough to address the needs. Philanthropy has a role to fill that gap. Um, my hope is that we are learning lessons all along the way through this rapid response that will um, result in new programming between or new uh, collaboration between philanthropy and government agencies that will leverage and make even greater impact into the communities that are where it's needed the most. Absolutely, and one of the things that's um, so hard as we were just sort of tying, just to tie a couple of the last sets of comments together is, you know, Jordan, as everyone's trying to uh, pivot so quickly and 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 adjust and and um, so rapidly and innovate so rapidly, one of the things to to think about is how are we even um, trying to ke keep up with understanding who is accessing our services? How do they find out about us? Um, are we reaching everyone in need? Um, what are the places where to get to one of the questions in the chat where you know we're we're getting outside of the people that we normally serve? Um, and to the points we were making earlier, you know, making sure that we have representation across um, the spectrum of people that we are that we're reaching. So um, all of these things are. Uh, I appreciate sort of the, the comments about how we can balance a number of those different pieces in this time when we're trying to both um, to innovate and to um, keep up with support and make sure that philanthropy is sort of as tethered to um, the ground and to and to the needs um, as possible. So so I appreciate those. Um, there's one more question from the chat that I'm going to take, and then um, I'll give each of you a chance to um, give us sort of a parting message. Um, it doesn't have to be a tweet per se, but just sort of the the headline in your mind. If you could leave our our um, our webinar participants with one idea. Um, the, the one I'm going to pick out from the chat, and um, Jordan, maybe I can call on you to do this one, is um, how is it that you reach out to people who we may not have necessarily um, seen in the past, or you know, as we, as we look forward and the need changes over time, how do you think about continuing to, um, again, pivot, adapt, um, and, and figure out who needs to be reached and served, and, and how, to, how to do that, how those needs are changing? Yeah, I think the key to, to a lot of that is partnerships. Um, partnerships with philanthropic organizations, with foundations who can feed us their observations. I know here in Pittsburgh, I'm sure in many other parts of the country, um, foundations are surveying nonprofit providers, they're surveying members of the community to identify what the needs are and then feeding us back that information so we can determine which kinds of needs we are well equipped to, to meet. 
um, and also partnerships with, um, within the Jewish community. We have a very strong partnership in Pittsburgh with our local Jewish Federation, and they've set up a hotline, a COVID hotline, um, so that people who um, maybe don't know which organization is the best one to approach can reach out to the hotline, explain what their needs are, get connected with the appropriate resources. Um, you know, again, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. I mean, that's really um, no organization, no entity can solve major social issues by themselves. They need to be working with funders, they need to be working with clients, they need to be working with service providers in order to figure out the best way to get, to get needs met. Good. Good. Well, we are approaching the end of our time. We have about five or six minutes left. Um, I just want to ask if there are any, before we do that last, um, everyone's last headline, are there any other thoughts that have um, come to mind um, from you listening to each other and thinking about um, the different points that everyone else has made, um, things that you didn't maybe get a chance to say, but, but might make a connection um, given some of the other comments that you heard today? Well, I just put this in the chat. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about, because some of the questions on the chat were, you know, how do you get the word out? How do you let people know? And, you know, one of the things that I once heard uh, somebody say, a CEO from another JFS, which I thought was very wise, was um, that you never cut marketing in times of crisis. And I think that um, there's a tremendous uh, wisdom in that statement, but, um, you know, you can have phenomenal ideas and you really can pivot. But if nobody knows that you're doing them, um, you've got a major problem. And so finding ways to reach the community um, is oh so important, um, you know, in this, in this uh, crisis moment. And I will just add, uh, I think it, it's implicit, but I will make it explicit. Staying in touch with your uh, with your funders, your funding sources, and making sure that whether it's it, everybody's busy, so I'm not saying it needs to be a full report, uh, but uh, a sentence or two. Uh, here's what's happening. But as important as it is for funders to get proximate, it also works the other way. Um, I think it's important for uh, grantees just to. Uh, let funders know. Good. I just want to pick up on that. Last kind of way yeah. This crisis. Yeah. I want to pick up on that because I think there's something about keeping the information flowing um, that ties a number of these comments together where, again, Jordan, I think as you said, in an yeah. ideal world, we'd be piloting and learning and experimenting and measuring and then roll before we're rolling out. And now we're rolling out before we even know what we're rolling out. Um, and so just the information flow of who's not in the room, who aren't we hearing from, who aren't we talking to, um, the partnerships with people that maybe we haven't um, been in touch with before, but we're needing to, to pull in um, and keeping that information flowing. Because I think, again, otherwise, that is sort of the whole theory of these these webinars and the poverty group is just to make sure that not only does information flow because it's changing so quickly, but also that funding decisions are made based on what we're seeing on the ground and how the need is pivoting um, and not the other way around. Um, and, and that these are really being driven by ideally the beneficiaries and the needs in the community um, in, mm -hmm. in multiple demographics mm -hmm. um, by race, by age, by income level, um, and rather than the funders driving it, um, although funders have a very important role to play. So, all right, we are almost at the end of our time. Um, I want to give everybody a chance to give a, a final parting thought. Um, I'll go first, just in case you need a couple more seconds to, um, to come up with your parting thought. You know, mine is really around the importance of, of, uh, of, of communication. So I think I will pick up on Paula Goldstein, yours, which is um, never cut uh, communications um, and, and outreach in a time of crisis. Um, it looks like overhead, but, but um, it's one of the most important things um, to keep everybody uh, aligned. So that will be mine. Um, let me start with you all. Um, Paula or Jordan, do you want to start? And then um, we'll let Paula uh, Pratlow have the last word. Sure, I'll go next. Um, as I said before, you know, this crisis is a marathon, not a sprint. And so uh, keeping in mind that the needs that we see today um, will not be gone tomorrow, um, well into the summer, well into the fall. 
Uh, we are going to continue to be dealing with the repercussions of this crisis. And um, that means that um, expectations need to be placed in check. You know, that we, we will um, need to continue to uh, observe and question and survey and identify what the needs are, figure out the best way to get those needs met, find the funding to support that work, um, and that this is, this is a long haul. Um, and this needs to be done through partnerships, through the philanthropic community and the service delivery community um, and the government. Um, each has a role to play here. We can't do it alone, and uh, we'll be most effective if we do it together. Great. Paula Goldstein? Yes. Uh, what I would say is, I heard again uh, somebody say that the COVID crisis is a crisis not only of public health, but of innovation. And I really do believe that uh, it's important for us to think of ways to pivot. I know that everybody has said this on this call, uh, but people respond and react differently in moments of crisis. And we are human service providers, and we need to be have that at the forefront of our minds when we are trying to create services that will help people. We have to be able to possibly look in a much more expansive way um, at what people need and offer that to people um, in the midst of the crisis. Great. Paula. The last word, my kids would say, mom, you always want the last word. <laughs> so I would take it. Mine is very simple. I'm gonna go back to the uh, theme, the three things I said earlier, because it relates to the communities we serve in general. And I want to ask each and every one of us on this call to pay a tip, particular attention when we're talking about communities of color and Jews of color. Get proximate, get reflective, get accountable. Well, that is a phenomenal message to end on. Thank you so much. And thanks to all three of you for your time. Um, the posting of this uh, recording will be on the Jewish Funders Network website hereafter. So Tamara, do you want to give us a few final words? I Thank you so much. And thank you, Susan, for again, masterfully uh, facilitating this conversation. And thank you, Paula, Paula, and Jordan for sharing your, your thoughts and your time and your wisdom with the group. Um, like Susan just mentioned, you will be able to find this recording on jfunders.org in the next few days. And along with the previous recordings, you can always reach out to me at tamar at jfunders.org if you have any questions or issues finding it. And I hope all of you will join us at our, at our next one, which is going to be on Tuesday, June 9th from 12 to 1 Eastern time. So 9 to 10 um, Pacific time. And um, if you RSVP for this one or the last one, I will automatically RSVP, you, RSVP for you for that one, and I will send you the Zoom information the day before. So again, thank you all for, for joining us today and stay well and hope to see you again soon. Thank you all.